Grace and peace to you from God and the Lord Jesus. Amen. I'm going to go to the children today because we only have a couple of very young ones. You can join us back here if you feel like a kid today. But I think we'll come back down here. Do you guys want to come meet me right over here? How do you do it? Yeah, come on over. Hi. Right here. Good morning. How are you guys doing? I know you probably heard me say that I'm going to say it again. School starts tomorrow. <laughs> I have no control over that, so this time you can't wait. And I'm so sorry. But school isn't such a bad thing because one of the things that we can learn at school is some wisdom. Now, your parents have already taught you some wisdom, but you can never learn too much because even if you get as old as I am or even older than me, you can always learn from God's wisdom. Indeed, is truly wise. So I thought we'd try to figure out some wise things today. See if we can learn some wisdom. So, do you think it would be wise to sleep during the day and stay up all night? That sounds tempting, but it's probably not wise because if you did that today. School tomorrow, that would not go very well, would it? Your teachers would be poking part of you going, wake up, wake up, wake up. I don't think that's wise. Let's try something else. Do you think it would be wise to stand on your head all day long? No? I'm not sure he wants to answer that one. I don't blame you. That one sounds like a trick, but that's probably not wise. It's not bad to stand on your head for a little bit, but after a while, see, our bodies aren't meant to do that. Let's see. Here's one. Would it be wise for you guys to do the sermon today for me to just sit down? Well, I think if I prepared it, that'd be a great idea. But that probably wouldn't be very wise if I just said, okay. Now you gotta do the sermon. Go. That's not a very wise pastor who does that, because that's not very fair. Or what if I did this? How about if I gave your sister a whole bag of lollipops and I gave you nothing? Just because I thought, oh, I like her. She seems good. You think that would be wise? No. <laughs> no good answer. No. We learn from God, though, some very serious things about being wise. And one of them is to always follow Jesus. That's probably the best wisdom that I can give you. So when you're here in church or at home and you hear the words of Jesus like you just did, it's always best to follow his advice because he has true wisdom. So I think we'll be pretty wise if we do that. And so with that, let's go ahead and join in prayer. Are you ready? Let's pray this thing. Here, we're just going to bow down. Good morning, Lord. Here we are today. We ask for your wisdom that she will guide us in all that we do and say. Help us to be good. Help us to be right. Always to remember that you are the way, the truth, and the light. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you guys very much. And I'll ask Car, maybe we can rustle up a couple of suckers for you guys. Have any lollipops back there? Good job, Car. All right. I am the bread of life. We have been hearing this for a number of weeks, and spoiler alert, you're going to hear it again next week as well. But I want to back up to God and God's wisdom. In the Old Testament, we talk about, when we hear wisdom, that is the, what we would call the feminine aspect of God. We're familiar with God the Father, especially when Jesus cries out in very intimate terms on the cross. Uh, that's more like dad. It's very intimate. So that's that's the male aspect because we're created in God's image, male and female. The female aspect comes through in the wisdom of God. And I hope you were listening to those words because those were very important words this day. Come, eat of my bread and drink of the wine that I have mixed. That should sound familiar, as Jesus will now encompass that in the flesh. You see how they fit together? How now, that aspect of God, God's wisdom, 
Jesus will now truly live it out in the flesh and offer it, his flesh and his blood, for you and me. But then I don't want to just gloss over that other part that I hope you're paying close attention to this morning. Lay aside immaturity and live and walk in the way of insight. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. In other words, absolute trust in the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If we'll only listen to it. The book of Proverbs acknowledges that we have a certain lack of wisdom because we only have human wisdom. And unless we think that we have all wisdom, remember, only God has all the true wisdom. We are always in process. Like my old seminary professor talked about process theology. We're always in process, no matter how old or how young we are, to learn more wisdom from God. Because no matter how much we think we have, God always has something to teach us every single day of our lives. Now, that connects up when we come into the Gospel of John this morning. Because as wisdom says, come and eat of my bread and drink of the wine that I am next. Now Jesus says, Jesus says, I am the living bread, and literally talks about eating his flesh and blood. Now, of course, Luther jumped on this. And he said, to eat is to believe with this connection to the Lord's Supper, to Holy Communion. And it makes sense for us, of course, because we can make that leap, can't we? Going from what we hear in Proverbs, now to Jesus and understanding, well, yeah, this is a reference to Holy Communion. But think of it this way. What if you were to go someplace where people had never heard the Word of God? They never heard of Jesus, or they only have a passing understanding that, oh, there was this, quote, Jesus. Now, imagine one of the things you're going to tell them is, well, what you need to do, as Jesus said, is to eat his flesh and drink his blood. I don't know about you, but if somebody came to me and said, oh, we're going to eat his flesh and drink her blood, I would be thinking, are you people cannibals? I'm a little concerned about you. It sounds far-fetched, but think about it. Think about the difficulties that incur in spreading the word when we have these kinds of passages. If you take them literally. Luther says, in the best way possible, because we don't truly understand how this works, that when we eat the bread, drink the wine, that Jesus is in, with, and under. Does anybody want to expound on that for about an hour? I used to have a seminary classes where we would go, not just an hour, hours and hours trying to explain that. What does this mean? That's a quote directly from the Bible that Luther used all the time. But in essence, it's this. Even though our church bodies this day disagree on what it means, from transubstantiation to remembrance to real presence, the best thing to say is that Christ is present. That no, that we're not literally offering up, offering up a visible Jesus in the flesh and taking his flesh and blood. But we are experiencing God's real presence, the presence of Christ Jesus in the bread and in the wine. That may sound simple enough to us because, after all, we've been in church for a while. Who here is brand spanking new to church and never been here before? Anybody? See, I'm kind of preaching to the choir so to speak, aren't I? But imagine, how do we share the faith to people? This is just one of the many examples in the Bible where we as people of God need to gather in places like this, in our homes, in Bible studies, during your devotion times, and wrestle with, how do we share this good news? How do we share it? 
things aren't always simple because when you say things literally, you take them in a fundamental way, as a fundamentalist might, it would be pretty difficult to try to get this good news out to people. And I wouldn't blame them. They would kind of look at you and think, these are some bloodthirsty people there. But think on this. How does Jesus set this all up? Remember, words, the word of God is so very important. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Jesus says, now I am the true Messiah. There have been others who have been proclaimed about throughout the centuries. The people of Israel have waited so long. But I am the Messiah. That means I am the living bread. What I offer you will go beyond not only what your ancestors ate in the wilderness, but we'll go beyond even when we pray the Lord's Prayer when we talk about daily bread. Because this will go through our whole lives and sustain us no matter where we find ourselves. This living bread will sustain our faith, especially when it's put to the test. This living bread will sustain us to that very last moment of life, because this, this living bread brings us the promise that this life only ends for this existence, for the human body, for the human blood. But this living bread gives us the resurrection, because what does Christ do? He sacrifices his body and blood in an act of sacrificial love to save others, literally, to save the world. I am the bread of life. To come to God, you come through Jesus. To come to God, you come through the bread of life. And one of the ways that we experience this real presence of grace and forgiveness, as Luther points out to us, is when we gather for communion. So why talk about it on a non-communion Sunday? Because I want us to think about it this week. Think about what it means when you come for Holy Communion. What does it mean to have the real presence of Christ in the bread of life? What does it mean for you then not only internally for that gift of grace and forgiveness, but then, what does it mean once we go back out into the world? Jesus says, I am the living bread. This is the bread that came down from heaven. The one who eats this bread will live forever. What does that promise mean for you? What does that mean for you right now in your life? What will it mean for you these next six days until we come back here on the seventh day, on the Sabbath, and experience Holy Communion? One of the questions that's often brought about in this particular text is another one I want you to think about as you prepare for Holy Communion. And especially if you can't make it back for either Saturday or Sunday service. If you're going to be out and about, since it will be a holiday weekend. But even if you come here, I want you to think about this. How will you be the bread of life this week for others? Think on that. Remember in the Gospels, we are to be Christ for others. We are to be the light of Christ for others. So, as Jesus says, I'm the living bread, how will you personify the living bread for others this week? And when you come to communion, or even if you won't be here, next Saturday or Sunday, you take your Sabbath time to pray to God, to give thanks and praise, whether it's a short or a longer time. Think on this. How will you have been the living bread for others? How will you have shown them this Jesus who is the living bread? <clears throat> and those who gather for communion, think on it each.
each time. What does it mean for you when you gather to eat of his flesh and drink of his blood? In other words, to have the bread, to have the wine, to have God's word with those earthly elements. What will it mean for your life? I am the living bread, says Jesus. May we all have the bread of life that satisfies here and throughout our eternal life. Amen.